to everyone who has joined uh, i welcome all of you thank you so much for joining today and uh, before uh, beginning i hope uh, everyone safe um, uh, everybody is safe in their houses and uh, everything's fine with all of you without uh, any delay i now request dr abdul karim uh, center head of uh, center for conservation of natural resources to just give a brief introduction about uh, ddu and what we do uh, uh, so i request dr karim to go ahead and give a small introduction yeah Thank you, Nishant. Can you just display uh, the presentation? Yeah. Uh, good evening to all of you. Um, I just thought that uh, before we uh, really enter into the presentation, I'll explain what TDU is. As uh, many of you are uh, will be knowing uh, recently, what Transdisciplinary University is doing. Yeah. Next slide. So uh, a TDU, you could see, uh, has been conceived as a FRST Foundation for Revitalization of Local Health Tradition as a trust, which was been founded in the year 1993 by uh, two main people, um, Sir Sam Petroda and Sri Darshan Shankar. And it was evolved out from 27 years on the pioneering work of FRST as a trust. I'm going to explain you what, in short, what exactly has been done. And in the year 2014, it was registered as a state university and uh, uh, TDU's research mission is to interface between the traditional knowledge system and the modern science. So this is a major, uh, one of the important uh, research mission which TDU has. Next slide. So uh, I'm just going through with you exactly in short, what exactly are the milestones that we have achieved from the year 1993 till 2020 to 2021. In the year 1993 uh, uh, till now, we have established 110 medicinal plant conservation areas, which specifically have the uh, germplasm of medicinal plants uh, from 13 states uh, of 13 states, which are of rare endangered and threatened species, which have been conserved in this area with the help of the state forest department. In the year 1995, where we have established even now, continuing till date, continuing with the databases and the herbarium of medicinal plants of India, one of the leading databases that we have. In the year 1998, we have, uh, until now, even till date, we are trying to network with the folk healers, the traditional healers uh, all over the country from all the nine to 10 states and trying to extend the states more and more every year. In the year 2000, we have established a science lab, which this is a unique lab, which has a bridge, which bridges between the traditional knowledge and, uh, uh, and, uh, and um, science. This is one of the good lab. A lot of research works are going on in this. And then in the year 19, uh, Nishan, come to the earlier slide. There's a, ah, yeah, keep this, yeah. So in the year 2002, uh, we have really contribution to the government of India on the national policy on local health traditions, which was a very good contribution, which has been recognized well by the government of India through the Ayush ministry. And in 2005, we have cataloged more than 10,000 medicinal plant manuscripts, which are lying all over the country, which are not been published in the form of a manuscript form catalog and we are trying to also translate a few of them into a proper use so that people can really use on it. Then the year uh, 2003 onwards, we also established a number of thousands of herbal gardens in the country, which can really take care of the primary healthcare needs of the community in the village. And in 1995, uh, we have really uh, established a nice, uh, we have contributed a lot for the five years plan of the government of India under the Ni uh, National Ayush mission. And in 2010, we had also then established a national training center for ethno veterinary uh, and a lot of series of veterinarians from the country are getting trained on this on traditional medicine, how really that can help on that. And in 2011, we have uh, uh, established a hospital, which is an uh, Ayurvedic uh, hospital, which has been really giving a, a scientific and Ayurvedic same way, which has been put into it is a high, high quality hospital of more than 100 bed hospital, which has been established. And in 2013, where we have the university status, which I was mentioning, and 2018, we have established the holistic nutrition and education program as a separate department. Uh, so these are the, some of the major achievements that we have done till 93 till 2020 to 21. Yeah, next slide. These are certain awards that we have received on the good work which has been done. There's a normal Borlaug award, 
the Equity Initiative Award, and also uh, ministries have uh, considered us as a, both Aish, the Health Ministry and the uh, Forest Ministry as a National Center of Excellence. And also uh, uh, the University of uh, Medical School of Columbia University has given us a leadership in traditional medicine. And our two uh, founders have conferred with Padma Bhushan and Padma Shri, which is the Government of India's prestigious award. Next. And this is just a hospital's uh, uh, photograph that we have I've just shown that. Next. So uh, now, uh, as a university, we are also having different courses on different focal areas. That is on conservation of medicinal plants, on informatics, on plant systematics, medicinal manuscripts, on ethno-veterinary courses and practices, Ayurvedic clinical research, on life sciences and nutrition, and community health. Next slide. So one of the courses that we are going to launch, we had it, but we are going to launch now also for the next year is on the MSc Life Science, which is on conservation practice. To what practical and sustainable use of do Western Guard communities put into their local plant to use? This is one of the unique course which we are trying to uh, uh, bring uh, launch this year. Next. And another course already we are, we are going to launch coming, coming year is on MSc Life Science, which is a unique course again. It's on Ayurveda biology. And uh, we have different uh, webinars to see exactly explain about what this course is. Next. So uh, any contact, this is our contact. One can contact us and ask us about our thing. So now I stop with what exactly what the institution is. And now I welcome our guest who is going to talk. I'll not take much of his time. As you know, I, we have sent you the, uh, his, his, his entire work that he has done for the world on his professor, Andrea uh, Pironi. We welcome you, sir. Uh, he is a rector from the University of uh, 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 University of Gastronomics Sciences, Italy, and he is also trained as a medical botanist, and uh, uh, in the University of Pisa. And if you see his work, he is also served as a uh, as a as a vice president and president of International Society of Ethnobiology from the period of 2008 to 2010, and he is founder of the chief editor of Journal of Ethnobiology and Ethnomedicine. And his publication is a lot. If you could see his publication a lot. And his major thing is also on the case of food cultural heritage and the dynamics that he works on the case of uh, uh, and sees that exactly how uh, the, the knowledge of ethnic community with the science, how it really establishes a link, which is one of the important things which he is doing. And uh, also his link world over, if you could see his CV and see the link that he has all world over the, on how he's trying to establish a linkage and network towards people. In this case of research collaboration, and a lot to say uh, uh, about him. So I welcome um, Professor Andrea. Can you? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for accepting this and uh, in this very busy schedule. Yeah, I now leave it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, let me say we are all sympathetic with the situation in India. We are in Europe very well aware of what is going on. Uh, and we as Italian, we know more uh, maybe than other Europeans because we had a similar, not just the same, but similar situation one year ago. So we are all on your side. This is very important. And the friendship between India and Europe um, uh, needs, of course, to be fostered further, not only in this difficult time, but also after. Now, I will try to uh, humbly uh, uh, present basically uh, the, the main uh, distillate of uh, my research in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, as you know, I am a medical botanist who moved into ethnobotany and especially at the beginning medicinal ethnobotany and uh, later shifting on the food ethnobotany. These two domains of food and medicine are very close. You know better than anyone else because uh, the Indian Ayurvedic system has developed uh, um, this uh, uh, holistic vision uh, uh, as first in the world many thousand years ago. I will try to illustrate a few insights from my research which uh, is focusing on the territories between the Mediterranean and the Middle East. So, first of all, in the um, 
worldwide literature, there is a lot of discussion about this Mediterranean diet. What is the Mediterranean diet? The Mediterranean diet is the dietary system of uh, rural areas in the Mediterranean, is uh, a system which developed through centuries and millennia, and is a system basically uh, based on uh, a lot of vegetables is uh, a system based on olive oil, is a system based on a few dairy products and red wine. This system um, was uh, gaining the attention of many scientists 20 years ago when uh, the discussion was about the French paradox, was about uh, to see and to understand if this dietary system could be helpful for the human health. Nowadays, we have, of course, an enormous amount of data, not only on the Mediterranean diet, on other dietary systems that are considered very healthy. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the Indian system is at the top of this, uh, of this list. But what is interesting is that this system, despite have been studied for many decades in terms of botany, in terms of chemistry, in terms of nutritional sciences, in terms of pharmacology, is still partially unknown for what concern um, a component, um, a, 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 let's say, a, 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 an interesting component of uh, the uh, diet, which is represented not by the cultivated vegetables, but by the wild vegetables, the things they are collected from the wild, especially in the period spanning between October and May. So between October and May, the Mediterranean system traditionally did not have cultivated vegetables available. Nowadays, of course, we have everything available in the supermarket, but this was the system uh, developed through centuries and managed and consumed by poor people in the countryside. Why should ethnobotany be interested in this system and in the healthy benefiting components of this system? Well, first of all, because all over the world, not only in the Mediterranean, there are many ingredients in the diet. They come from uh, the wild environments and they are very little known, both in terms of botany and in terms of chemistry. Second point, one could argue, well, this system is very unknown or still partially unknown or hidden because it was very often managed by poor women. And the voice of the woman, both in science and also in the public policies, uh, has never been really um, a, a big issue. Uh, big uh, food programs talk about cereals, talk about uh, carbohydrates, but very uh, rarely um, say something about these wild ingredients. Another uh, reason is that, of course, nowadays, especially in the West, but I know in, Indian, in India too, because I have Indian students here, and they bring me also uh, the update of what is going on in the gastronomy in India, especially in the cities, there is a foraging euphoria. That means that the peoples are are in a very paradoxical way going back to the wild vegetables. Sometimes this trend is celebrated and is driven by celebrity chefs. Celebrity chefs, they use wild ingredients. They use wild ingredients in a very artistic way. They have millions of followers on Instagram and they create a new trend. The third reason um, is related to the fact that uh, researching local plant uses can disclose uh, the evolution of food and medical systems in a, in a certain territory in the world. Um, very often food and medical systems co-evolve together with the environment, of course, uh, with the natural environment and the natural um, plants growing uh, in that environment, but also with the societies. Um, underpinned in this environment. For me, uh, two main uh, uh, guides were crucial in my life, in my scientific life, Daryl Posey and Mina Etkin. Daryl Posey was uh, a, the father of the modern ethnobiology 
and was used to say that there is an inextricable link between nature and culture. Nina Etkin was an American anthropologist working on the food uh, medicines used in Africa and was uh, used to say that uh, uh, the biocultural and coevolutive perspective help to explore the interaction between culture and food and to understand also the health implication of local food. Um, this has been very crucial in my career. And when I started my career as an ethnobotanist, I have said uh, uh, before Dr. Karim that uh, my first link to ethnobotany was uh, via the Indian Society of Ethnobotany. I was uh, the youngest and I think uh, the, at that time, um, probably uh, one of the very few European members of the society 25 years ago. Um, I know of your big loss uh, uh, with the professor uh, Jain who passed away last week. Um, at that time, the ethnobotany in the world and especially the ethnobotany of wild uh, vegetables was underdeveloped. If you see, in 1988, we had in Scopus basically no articles on ethnobotany. Uh, 10 years later, 31 articles, but still zero on wild food plants. And nowadays, we have uh, around uh, four or 500 articles every year linked to ethnobotany, indexed in Scopus. And uh, I would say one tenth of these uh, articles is about wild food plants. So I will try to make a, a summary of my achievements in terms of uh, conceptualizations through the journey that uh, brought me uh, from the postdoc in Southern Italy to work as I do now in the Middle East and especially in Kurdistan. So there will be a little bit of roller coaster. Southern Italy, 20 years ago, um, in the most isolated areas in Southern Italy, there is a still traces of traditional nutrition. The people do not go, still go lower, not yet, to McDonald's or to the supermarkets only. Old women especially are used to collect plants from the environment, especially the environment around the village, around the the vineyards around the olive orchards. And they collect uh, many plants and they have their own ideas about the classification of these plants that they collect for food and for making teas as well. They divide, they classify the herbaceous plants into two categories. The herbaceous plants you can eat and those you cannot eat. And uh, this is even lexicalized with a very specific terminology, bara and yakra. This is something we don't know, of course, in the classification of biology or botany, because the classification of botany is uh, strictly morphological. It's never functional, as you well know. Um, uh, ethnobotany never entered into the classification of, uh, of, of the plants. Even nowadays, there are certain moves uh, uh, proposing uh, to at least consider the local plant names back, uh, of course, together with the official uh, uh, binomial nomenclature. In this, uh, um, in this uh, southern Italian uh, uh, inland remote areas, a peoples um, are still used to gather plants and to um, uh, visit different environments. And the plants they, they, they collect in specific environments um, are considered uh, related. So there is a kind of an ecological, let's say, uh, landscape, but there is also the, um, um, the same landscape is in the mind of the people. They use plant names folk plant names. They are similar for plants growing in similar environments. So there is a huge connection between the con cognitive structures underpinned in the folk nomenclature of plants and the ecological space. One of the most interesting plants gathered there um, is Leopoldia comosa, are bitter bulbs. They are considered extremely healthy 
and they are eaten on regular basis during the year. The plant is collected in October, but uh, is pickled and then eaten all over the year. It's considered the most important food medicine in the area. But uh, we have also other situations, not only plants that they are considered food and medicine at the same time what we may call functional foods. But there are also plants that are considered food in certain uh, circumstances and medicine in other circumstances. Sometimes uh, the preparations, of course, are very different. But there are also, and this is the third picture um, um, at the bottom, we have a very interesting situation, not only in Southern Italy, all over the world, of course, uh, people ingest consume plants with the specific aim to improve their health. Not just to cure a specific illness, but to improve the health, to prevent illnesses. So these are an interesting category of uh, food medicines, which are very prone, of course, to be further uh, let's say, uh, investigated and developed, because nowadays the interest in the impact that diet has on the prevention of illness is very important in uh, all the discourses regarding health. So the South Italian experience um, was able to tell us that uh, the wild herb knowledge and preferences are profoundly linked to cognitive patterns, in turn linked to ecology, and also to health perceptions. Because the plants that are gathered are normally those plants that are considered healthier than others. So it's not about uh, edibility. There are many edible plants that have never been gathered in the world by local cultures. And there are sometimes even problematic plants in terms of toxicology, they have been consumed and they are still consumed. The second case study I want to, um, to dig out is the Albanian case study. So we are in Southeastern Europe in a context of very um, pristine environments, alpine environments, what we call Dinaric Alps, and very, if you may want to say, a very um, backward uh, um, uh, um, economy. These countries, especially Albania, uh, come out from a very tough communist time and uh, are still among uh, the poorest and uh, more disadvantaged uh, European and worldwide countries. In this kind of environment, wild plants play also a very interesting role. And uh, wild plants are managed also uh, in a very interesting way because uh, it's true the plants are wild, but uh, human beings are sometimes able to manage also wild plants. For example, here you see pastures for animals where rye is cultivated, but uh, um, close to the rye patches, there are uh, uh, rumex species, canopodium species, uh, um, Amaranthus species, they are tolerated. They are uh, uh, tolerated by human beings because they are considered very tasty wild vegetables. Um, I would like to point attention to a couple of plants. They are very prototypical for the foodscape in Northern Albania. One is oregano. Oregano is a plant which you may know from uh, the pizza. Uh, all over the places in the world where pizza is sold, pizza has normally tomato, uh, cheese, and oregano on it. It's a very old Italian tradition. But uh, instead, in Northern Albania, oregano is uh, never used as a seasoning, is used as a tea, and is a very daily tea which is drunk in any kind of occasion. It's uh, um, pretty interesting. Another aspect which is a little bit uh, different from uh, what uh, we can observe in most places in the world, in Albania, in these Alps, there are still many 
uh, knowledgeable person regarding uh, wild plants among the youngest members of the community. So we cannot only imagine old ladies gathering or old men gatherings. There are also knowledge and practices regarding wild food plants in the hands of the kids. The kids transmit the knowledge to other kids. And this knowledge is normally, um, uh, is normally forgotten when the kids uh, become adults. So it's not a vertical transmission of knowledge, it's an horizontal transmission of knowledge. In this case, including an interesting wild garlic, but this horizontal transmission of knowledge is very interesting because it's very prone to change and to uh, incorporate novelties. And uh, this also explain why traditional knowledge sometimes is very quickly changing, is not static, is not only old um, and made by old, uh, by old things. Another important point in Northern Albania is that a few plants are transplanted from the wild into the home garden because they are considered very tasty and healthy. This is one of the example, Lilium martagon, is transplanted into the home garden and used as a, a food medicine against digestive problems. Is eaten raw before breakfast and in order to have the plant easily available, the plant grows uh, high in the mountains, the villagers um, are attempting to domesticate the plant. So there are still attempts all over the world of domestication. And this um, is especially important for wild plants. They are considered very special and they are not uh, easily available on a daily basis. And uh, of course, there is also um, the tradition you can find uh, all over the Middle East from Italy up until Tajikistan and China of using wild orchids and uh, the tubercles of wild orchids. This is a very old tradition. The wild orchids are dried the tubercles and they are powdered and they are consumed in milk or in, uh, in water. Uh, in this uh, kind of beverage is considered very healthy, especially uh, for uh, people, uh, they are very weak. And in these uh, specific cases, uh, we realize that actually the end of the communism increased the consumption and the gathering of wild uh, orchids. Um, this is surely was due also to the fact that after the communism, trade was again possible. And one kilo of these tubercles are sold in Europe on the black market for 100 euros. So paradoxically, the end of a system which uh, um, was, let's say, uh, pretty, um, pretty organized in terms of uh, delivering uh, nutritional care, even destroying the traditions of the village. At the end of these systems, the people moved back to their past, not on the same scale, but even more than in the past. So in one word, traditional knowledge and practices regarding plants are very dynamic and respond to various socio-ecological change. Um, the changes can be ecological, for example, nowadays, uh, surely one of the most important global factor changing and affecting the environment is the climate change, but can be also, as in the case of Albania, social changes. So traditional knowledge regarding plants is never static. The idea that traditional knowledge is static is bringing ethnobotany into a cemetery. Also because if you see food traditions, especially food traditions all over the world, are mainly the result of exchanges, of uh, um, cultural diffusions, of uh, specific customs moving from one country to the other. And this is not happening now because we are in a globalized world word, it was very much the case also in the past.
you, you can imagine the most iconic dish of the Italian cuisine is uh, noodles with tomato sauce. Noodles are not Italian. They have been brought to Italy by the Arabs and tomato sauce, tomatoes of course, came from the new continent. So the Italianness it is in this dish is the idea to put noodles and tomatoes together, but it's not an Italian dish in terms of the, of the ingredients being native to Italy. The third case study I want to uh, show regards a, a, a very uh, awkward and unknown diaspora of Italians living in Romania. These Italians from Venice moved to Romania about 150 years ago because they were skilled um, workers and uh, they remained there. They remained in, in a country which uh, was never their country, of course. So the study of diasporas are always very interesting because we can see in diasporas how these changes in the, um, in the use of wild plants look like. For example, these Italians use a lot of rumex species and they call this plant with the, um, an archaic name that in Italy um, is actually used for defining a soup. These Italians came originally from the mountains in Italy. They were used to prepare a very complex soup with very different wild vegetables. When they moved to Romania, of course, they couldn't find many of these vegetables in Romania, also because the landscape is very different. They didn't move in the mountains in Romania, but they moved in the so-called Pontic Steppe. So they could find only one plant of the many they were used to uh, gather in Italy. And they are still preparing this soup with just one plant, which is uh, um, actually rumex, there are different species of rumex, but uh, um, just one plant. Another interesting point in this community, which is very worth and very much linked to India, is the use of basil. You know that basil came into Europe from India. Basil has never been used in Europe, it's not a, a plant which is native in Europe. And basil in India is very important in the, in the rituals, it's a religious plant. Well, this tradition moved westward many um, millennia ago, and uh, this plant was adopted at the beginning in Christianity as a ritual plant too, exactly as it happened in, uh, um, in Hinduism. So the plant was used in the church, was not surely eaten. But at a certain point, Italians decided this plant was interesting for being eaten. Many dishes in Italy are based uh, on basil as a seasoning. Now, the Eastern Orthodox Church in Romania still considered the plant a plant for the church. Nobody could eat such a plant but in Italy is a food plant. So when the Venetians moved to Romania, they were in front of this dilemma. Should we use it like we were used to do in Italy or should we adapt to the new tradition, let's say, to the tradition of the host country in which we are now, the Romanian country. And the solution they found is extremely creative. Italians started hundred years ago to develop two varieties of uh, basil. One very long to be used only in the church, not to be eaten for no reason. And another variety, very small, very um, little, to be still used as it was uh, uh, used in Italy in food. So this means that the thrombotanical knowledge is also shaped by cultural negotiations between newcomers and the autochthonous people. And diasporic groups move within a continuum with different degree of cultural adaptation. And I would say the cultural adaptation still even depends upon the time in which this adaptation take place. Um, the time means the historical circumstances 
linked in turn to the different um, power codes that the different groups may have when they mix together. And they are never static as well. Another case study comes from uh, uh, still the southeastern uh, um, Europe, from Kosovo, and uh, um, it, uh, consider, uh, it considers um, a, a minority living in uh, Kosovo made by Albanians. They moved there many centuries ago, where um, in a time in which the Balkans were under a very bad demographic pressure in the 17th century. The 17th century demographic pressure in the Balkans, but also in mountain areas in Europe was produced by the introduction of maize. When maize was introduced from Goa, by the way, the maize came from America to Goa and then from Goa back to Europe. This is one of the reasons why in many places in Europe we call the maize the Indian grain. We do not call the American grain. Well, when the Indian grain, maize, arrived into Europe uh, in the uh, 17th century, uh, it generates a, a, a horrifying demographic pressure because there was more food available and the mortality decreased. So this was in turn a big problem in the mountains because the people could have not enough to eat. There were too much people in the mountains. So many peoples at that time migrated. One group of these people migrated into Kosovo from uh, uh, Northern Albania. And uh, they were Christians. They were Albanians. Now they still live in Kosovo. They still speak Albanian, but they converted into um, Islam. And interestingly, they still use a lot of Oregonum vulgare, as we have seen uh, peoples in Albania in the mountains uh, are used to do. And at the same time, they acquired new knowledge living together with the Slavs. One of the most important tradition among the Slavs is to lacto-ferment wild plants. In this case, juniper berries are put in water and salt. They are lacto-fermented. The resulting beverage is considered a kind of very healthy lemonade. It is drunk all over the summer. It is very uh, spread, this use. The resulting uh, fermented beverage is very sour and uh, also um, aromatic, of course. It, it does not smell really very, very nice, but it is very beloved by the, by the people there. So this shows how migrants and diasporas uh, move in this uh, dilemma between uh, strengthening their identities with the plants they still find in the environment and they are the same um, plants they were used at home and adapting, meaning acquiring, learning new plant knowledge from the neighbors. So we saw this, but we saw even more that actually the use of plants is strongly influenced by endogamic patterns, meaning Kinship relations um, shape the transmission of vertical, uh, um, the vertical transmission of plant knowledge, and kinship relations uh, explain why people shift uh, to use certain plants. In other words, religion is very crucial. Religious affiliation is still shaping in the Balkans, like in many areas of the world, I would say the majority of the areas of the world, um, shape kinship relations. So language is not important, but religion is very important. If you have uh, a diaspora made by people, they belong to another religion, they are very prone to keep their traditions because they do not mix with the others. Fifth case, Kurdistan. Why Kurdistan is so important? It's because uh, um, in Kurdistan, we have uh, um, got the Neolithic revolution, 
not just the Chinese uh, uh, development of agriculture, but the oldest development of agriculture that uh, you know for sure comes from the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent development of agriculture uh, uh, it was a, a terrific phenomenon and uh, 12,000 years ago and uh, created, let's say, a lot of uh, environmental and social changes. The agriculture moved from the Fertile Crescent westward towards Europe, the Mediterranean, and eastwards towards India too. So this place is very important for understanding the origin of our nutrition because uh, um, is uh, highly uh, uh, special in terms of uh, uh, evolution and in terms of ecology. And in uh, Kurdistan, still many wild plants are eaten as also in uh, Iran, as also Parsi in Bombay do, as Shabzi. Shabzi in the Persian culture is the attitude to eat a lot of wild vegetables raw, as a side dish, taking them with the hands. So it's not a salad, it's just a kind of uh, use of wild plants as snacks, but within a food context, not just snacks we eat on spot uh, in the countryside. And uh, Kurdistan is uh, the paradise for wild vegetables. Uh, there are more than 100 of wild different vegetables collected by the people. But what is interesting in Kurdistan is that uh, um, many different cultures and religions live together for many thousand years, at least until the development of the Islamic State, which a few years ago, of course, created a lot of problems and uh, in some cases it destroyed also these cultures. These different cultures and religions uh, uh, live together and they developed kind of a very complementary foraging attitude. Kurds, Kurdish people, mountain people, pastoralist peoples, shepherds are prone to collect plants from the mountains. And most of these plants are snacks. They are not cooked. They are eaten on the spot. They are very beloved for the crunchiness. For the sourness, this is wild rubber, um, widely collected by shepherds in Kurdistan and sometimes even sold uh, in the cities. And uh, this is a kind of artichoke that is uh, uh, spreadly used in the Middle East, Gundelia turneforti. Um, many garlic species, of course, garlic uh, um, diversity is uh, very high in Iran and Kurdistan, as you know, is the hotspot of the domestication of garlic and onions. And uh, rumex, again, aromatic plants, uh, even toxic plants like uh, uh, arum species, are gathered in Kurdistan. They are detoxified, um, washing the leaves with sumac or lemon in order to eliminate uh, oxalates. But what is in, in interesting is that this Kurdish culture also consumed plants we consider nowadays ornamental. Tulips, before becoming ornamental plants, were food plants in Central Asia, and especially in Kurdistan. The bulb was eaten, raw or cooked, and the same for crocus. But this is what the Kurds do, what the Muslim Kurds do, the pastoralists coming from the mountains. If we go in the same village, exactly the same village, but we interview the Christian Assyrians, the descendants, of those they developed agriculture there and they were converted into Christianity in the early years after Jesus Christ, we see a completely different patterns. The Christians live in the same village of the, of the Muslims, of the Kurds, but they don't go in the mountains to collect plants, they go in the plain because they are those they descend from the ones they developed agriculture. So they collect plants close to agric agricultural plots and they collect mainly weeds, 
Silibum Marianum, Nasturtium, Imperata Cylindrica. The Assyrian Christian foraging is the foraging of the plain. It is like you would have a village in the countryside. Half of the village goes up to collect plants and half of the village go down to collect plants. What does it mean? Of course, Lactuca cereola, which is very important in agricultural Neolithic food system because from this plant, uh, we developed all the salads of the world, right? All the uh, lettuce of the world and malva, very crucial and, uh, and, and other species, portulaca. So um, this shows that there is a huge difference in foraging practices depending upon the human ecological trajectory of the people. The people may live together for hundreds of years, but they never forget in a way also their nature, the nature to be hunters, the nature to be gatherers, or the nature to be shepherds, as in the case of Kurds, or the nature to be horticulturalists, as in the case of Assyrians. What does it mean? That these different human ecological trajectories bring different peoples to collect different plants and to love different tastes. So Muslim Kurds love to have pungent and sour plants. While Assyrians love to have uh, herbaceous or neutral uh, tastes. And Yazid, a farther group living together, um, they are more found of uh, bitter, pungent, and uh, neutral tastes. So the, the preference in the way plants are gathered, the preference in uh, being attached to a certain environment instead of another one brings also crucial consequences for the aesthetics of food. So local wild food plant preferences are the result of human ecological trajectories. And these trajectories have been formed for millennia plant choice and of course also the different attachment we have to different tastes. So if we want to sum up from these case studies, from these uh, very complex and fascinating intersection between food plants and medicinal plants, I strongly believe we need cross-cultural comparisons in ethnobotany focusing on different groups. This is crucial because to assess traditional knowledge in a place, full stop, means very little. We cannot understand much if we just make an ethnobotany of a single place. We need to compare. Second, we need also to compare in terms of temporal scale. That means to see the changes in gathering plants and this can be done in two different ways. We can, of course, go back to the same place, uh, uh, but we need one life to do that, right? If we have uh, to wait 40 years. But there is also another way to do that that is probably more feasible. We can discuss with the locals which plants they gathered in the past when they were children and which plants do they gather now. Third point, nowadays the knowledge of wild plants is all over the world not only passing vertically or horizontally, but is passing through social media. There are more and more groups, especially in the cities, of urbanized um, young people, they learn how to forage and what to forage via Instagram and Facebook, and we need to understand and assess the effect of these social media on the foraging practices. Last but not least, we need to understand more the sensory characteristics of the plants they are gathered, the appreciations. 
A medicinal plant is a medicinal plant, surely because uh, um, humans have demonstrated through centuries that this plant was effective. But the plant was recognized very often without botanical scientific knowledge because of its taste, of its smell. So we need to understand more about perceptions people have of different plants. And concluding for humble suggestions for future researchers interested in this foraging and that the interface between food and medical ethnobotany. It's very important to listen. Ethnobotanists are different from botanists. The botanists look at the nature and of course you cannot listen too much to nature. You can of course admire nature, you can meditate, but it's most probably the nature does not answer you. But with ethnobotany is different. You work with people, so you have to listen. Listen to every single old man and woman having knowledge. Sometimes not literate, but very, very skilled on nature knowledge. It's very important to act scrupulously. That means with rigor, but smiling, always. Because we have never to forget we are huge, privileged. Being able to study uh, nature and to study interactions between nature and humans. And most importantly, we need to share. This is also the big lesson we have to take from this pandemic and this difficult time. Sharing is not a, just about morality. It's not just good because we have to do that, but it's about pleasure. The solitary pleasure, of course, exists, but normal people, because people are social animals, um, need to share. And I think we need to share insights, reflections, data, also in science. This is very important for making science really useful for humanity. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Andrea. And just like you mentioned in one of your slides, it was certainly a roller coaster ride for all of us. Your session uh, where you took us from the Mediterranean area to Romania. And also, I must uh, confess that it was a pretty mouth-watering session because you took us through some really uh, tasty looking wild food. So uh, maybe when uh, the good time, the normal time starts, we can start foraging in our backgrounds. Uh, so thank you so much again for, uh, 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 you know, giving that wonderful talk. Uh, I uh, now request uh, Dr. Gurmeet, uh, who's the center head for the Center for Ayurvedic Biology and Holistic Nutrition, to give a perspective of what TDO is doing in these areas. And I have a few couple of questions that I can see in the chat box. We can come to that after, followed by Dr. Gurmeet Singh's insights. Uh, over to you, Gurmeet, sir. Thank you. I also had a few questions. Uh, extremely interesting uh, talk. It was fascinating listening to you, Professor Andre. And, uh, but I'll keep my questions uh, for later. Uh, and uh, so a few words about what we are doing uh, in our laboratory on, uh, on foods. So we have a program on holistic nutrition and uh, uh, as part of that, uh, we are creating an integrative, what we call as integrative nutrition database. Uh, we've started by uh, you know, curating uh, recipes, ancient recipes from uh, 34 classics spanning about 3000 years. Uh, so about 1500 BCE to about 17, 15, 16th century, uh, 17th century. Uh, and so around 3000 years. And uh, we've, uh, we've uh, looked at 34 books that we've identified in this phase. And so far we've collected about, curated about 4000 recipes. Uh, and from those recipes, we have made a list of uh, ingredients as well, right? And tried to then match those ingredients to uh, ingre the, their scientific names. Uh, what is interesting about these recipes, of course, is that in these texts, the recipes, today's recipe books are just talk about uh, the ingredients, the amounts of the ingredients and the way to cook. But these uh, recipes uh, 
talk about it are food and medicine, right? At the intersection of food and medicine. So they talk about uh, uh, all sorts of things uh, as to what are the medicinal properties of the food, uh, therapeutic properties. And, and when I say medicinal, I am talking about from uh, preventive, promotive, and curative all angles. It's not uh, medicine in the sense of only curative, but it is like it's more a wellness guide. But uh, along with these properties, there are also some taste guides uh, to it. There are uh, what time of the day, which season, what kind of body constitution should eat these recipes, uh, what other foods to pair it with, what not to pair it with. So all this interesting information is there along with many of these recipes. So that makes it an interesting database. And uh, as I said, this becomes one source of these recipes have become a source of food ingredients as well. And uh, we've then taken two other sources uh, for food ingredients. Uh, one is a food supplements uh, source from the Food Standards and Safety Authority of India, uh, uh, Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. And uh, the other is a modern uh, foods uh, which are used uh, today, which comes from the National Institute of Nutrition. So together now we have about uh, 1300, more than 1300 ingredients in our database. And we are trying to put together properties such as the modern food compositional properties about 180 different parameters. We're putting down um, the Ayurveda food properties of these. And these are known as Rasa, Guna, Virya, Vipak, Dhatu Karma, Dosha Karma, which kind of refer to, ref Rasa refers to the six tastes in Ayurveda, which comprise a balanced uh, diet or a balanced meal. And uh, the Ayurveda philosophy says that all these six tastes should be there. So besides sweet, sour, salt, uh, and bitter, there is also uh, pungent and astringent, which are described as uh, the rasa. So we look at the Ayurveda pharmacology, classify them as well. Uh, we also look at uh, the partitioning properties of these, because when we are cooking, you no, know, when you cook with oil, when you're cooking in water, you're steaming. So we, uh, we try and decipher for these recipes based on the partitioning properties such as uh, water or oil solubility parameters or relative volatilities, et cetera, which help us then deconstruct these recipes as to what was the recipe trying to target, which group of molecules was the recipe trying to target, right? Uh, and we have an interesting way of actually having two axes. One we call as the volatility axis, the other the polarity axis. And we try and see which of the quadrants uh, is uh, is this trying to target? So we have molecular information of uh, of these foods as well, uh, and uh, and then we have the sensory information. You mentioned sensory as well in your talk, and uh, so we look at what are the flavor descriptors which are used, what are the taste descriptors which are used uh, to define not only the food but also the list of molecules that we've curated for each of these foods, uh, and then we have the foraged versus farmed. Uh, categorization, which uh, recently uh, 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 was brought on by our uh, Center for Data Sciences. They, Dr. Venu, helped us uh, put that together. And the geographical distribution, where are these found in the Indian construct of the uh, seven, eight, nine uh, geographies, uh, geographical uh, zones, as we classify them, uh, where do these uh, grow? So, uh, so that's a database we are putting together. And the uh, uh, and we are also putting together a, a, a kitchen, uh, what we call as a, a it's a kitchen, uh, an interesting kitchen because it has uh, uh, the ability to cook uh, traditional recipes. So traditional grinding stones, uh, traditional flames. Ooh, we have seven, eight different kinds of fuels, right from cow dung briquettes to wood. Uh, to uh, to coal, charcoal, to modern fuels as well, uh, and uh, uh, so so we will have the ability to cook in tradi using traditional techniques in traditional vessels, but as well as uh, it's a modern kitchen and also it's a ultra modernistic uh, kitchen, molecular gastronomy kitchen because we'll have uh, ultra high shear, liquid nitrogen, vacuum, all those facilities as well to be able to do that. And the idea is to, as I said, deconstruct uh, recipes, contemporize them, uh, identify what should be the uh, 50 super foods from the foraged world uh, that we look at by classifying there uh, on four indices uh, that we are interested in, traditional knowledge index, 
uh, which refers to their use in traditional knowledge, to uh, the sustainability index, uh, where are they grown? Are they grown in uh, uh, marginal soils or, uh, or very fertile soils? Uh, what kind of energy inputs they require, greenhouse gases, etc. Uh, we look at their uh, nutrient density based on modern, modern parameters. Uh, and, uh, uh, and lastly, we look at their sensory index as to how would they fit into uh, a, a, in today's uh, diet. So uh, these are some of the things and they kind of translate into uh, three uh, things. One, of course, we use this database. We are planning to use it for it's a in silico food design engine for people looking to, uh, to, to play around and see, get ideas about new foods, new recipes, etc. We also use this database. We're using it to develop a personalized nutrition algorithm. I mentioned about uh, rules about in Ayurveda, at least about what kind of body type or body constitution should have what kind of foods. So starting with that premise and then integrating with the modern science, we are building a, uh, a personalized nutrition for the masses, as we call uh, an AI driven approach where this database will be the engine powering that. And then a program called uh, that we are trying to conceive is uh, what we call as healthy gardens, healthy kitchens, healthy lives. No, connecting the garden and by garden is not a cultivated garden, but it's the the nature as the garden. So uh, the foraged foods to the kitchen and uh, to make healthy lives eventually impacting our lives. So build it together. Uh, and uh, so st still conceptualizing this, but that's going to be that we have a kitchen with the uh, uh, ability to uh, stream videos because it will also have a kitchen theater with the uh, cameras so we can beam it to any place and have live demos and we are trying to set up in various districts as prototypes uh, uh, kitchens model kitchen small kitchen workstations where uh, uh, rural communities or district communities can come and the interaction can be two way we can learn from them and they can uh, and plus because they'll all be connected. So from one community to other communities, uh, we can explore ideas and see where that takes us. So these are the various ideas that we have on the table. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll just stop here. And uh, uh, Parim, yeah. I would like to make a brief yeah, sure. Darshan sure. here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Darshan is our vice chancellor, uh, Andrea. Yeah, just to introduce you. Yeah. Uh, I found the talk uh, very, very fascinating and it's perhaps one of the best talks I have heard on uh, ethnobotany. So um, I'd just like to make one critical remark. I mean, I, I, I was, uh, I mean, my, my first remark is absolutely fascinating. I mean, the interfaces between culture, food, history, you know, uh, botany, uh, and the lessons that were uh, pointed out, you know, one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely fascinating. So I'm, I, am, I, am, I am admiring, appreciating all that, but I'm making one critical remark. And my critical remark is that while we use the term and show interest in it, and we emphasize the need for cross-cultural, you know, uh, interaction, dialogue, uh, interpretation. I think that in the whole field of uh, ethnobotany, there is not enough of an importance given to uh, in in some sense to 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 um, understanding the the depths or the roots of uh, cultural knowledge, there is still a slight uh, skew, and it is Western ethnocentric. The interpretation, the whole field's interpretation. And I think we need to elevate cross-cultural into what my university calls transdisciplinary, which is, which is definitely cross-cultural, 
but it goes into cross cultural with a great deal more of understanding of the uh, roots of that cultural knowledge the principles underlying it and you may not have principles expressed uh, i mean today today you find that for example science is given uh, which is a european uh, cultural product is given a universal value and we are looking at food chemistry for example to understand food now food chemistry uh, is fine in terms of that perspective the the european perspective food chemistry or food biology in the way biology and chemistry are understood uh, have uh, a certain universality but i can point out that there are cultures which have a different understanding of food uh, which shows that chemistry then is incomplete you cannot translate food chemistry into nutrition because all that is examined in a laboratory you know proteins carbohydrates fats minerals or whatever do not translate uh, into the body in the same way in which uh, the chemist detects them in the lab the body is a very much more complex uh, system and there are other knowledge systems uh, other than the european knowledge system of chemistry and biology and pharmacology certainly in india certainly in china and i'm sure in practical terms in all the cultures that you have covered it's there and i think that the world should be now moving into a multicultural knowledge space we must begin to look it's not enough to say that traditional communities looked and classified plants uh, not based on morphology but based on functionality you need a new classification system in the world which combines morphology because it has its value along with functionality and all this will emerge when we create a platform for what i'm calling transdisciplinary today we only refer to it saying you know it is interesting to know that these cultures looked at food as in 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 terms of functional categories and not in terms of you know, the morphological categories have their limitations how long should the world be dictated only by that scheme of classification we need to broaden it and therefore i am looking for knowledge spaces knowledge institutions becoming multicultural which is what my university is aspiring to do and we call that term we use the term transdisciplinary so i'll just stop here with this slightly critical comment thank you yeah dr andre you like thank to you, yeah well i i cannot agree more so we need the uh, two main uh, things here we need uh, to build uh, a transdisciplinary platform and this is due uh, not only in ethnobotany all over the science and we need to decolonize science this is for sure but still the meaning of cultural is exactly going in this direction the problem in ethnobotany is this uh, too much works and too often the scientist analyze a specific cultural um, dimension and in order to build conceptualization uh, this is not enough in order to understand how culture works in perceiving and manipulating plants manipulating in a good way i mean we need to compare and of course ideally we need to compare um who is the we we should work together to compare so cross cultural approaches are very crucial in anthropology in order to understand how things work so this is uh, whether western or eastern is just a method um i agree with you that we terribly need uh, other voices and in in this respect your comment is uh, is extremely inspiring 
in the Western centric idea of science, we have uh, for too long avoided even to listen to other voices. And the science can only go ahead if we are inclusive and if we try to develop a meta language for understanding what we are doing and for working together. No, what I would say is, you know, after these COVID times and all make a difficult travel, if you actually visit a place, uh, if you visit Bangalore and you see, you will see that what you're saying, listening, I, we give a level playing field to different knowledge systems. And if you see the outcomes that are, I mean, the research outcomes or the knowledge outcomes, for example, what Gurmeet was referring to, I mean, food is, cannot only be interpreted in terms of modern chemistry and biology. And it's not sufficient to, of course it is, it is essential, but it is not sufficient to take into account the practical experience of ethnic communities about food and their properties. Uh, at least in a country like India or perhaps China, we can deepen our whole interpretation of food property because there is a whole knowledge system constructed, you know, which analyzes uh, taste and the biology of taste, so to say. Pharmacology conceived in a very, very different parameters from molecules and bioassays. And we are doing this work, you know, we are doing this work you, and laboratories are there and we also have this other knowledge at play. And so when you see the outcomes of that, you know, one will be inspired to see the, the tremendous potential that there exists in cross-culturality. So we invite you, you know, after this uh, I completely over. agree. I completely agree. The, the, the big point is that we need, uh, um, this is my style, and I think where the science is a little bit uh, stacking at the moment. We do not need, uh, uh, I mean, we need a vision that is a political vision, right? In terms of perspective or strategy. But we need also concrete uh, uh, science because uh, um, you mentioned China and India. I would mention every cultures of the world. It's not a matter of being big or small. Otherwise, you know, uh, we would all uh, end up to be Americans or Chinese or Indian. Um, the point here is uh, to make space for other views, but in concrete project, not just in claiming uh, um, continuously um, and things that they never happen. I am uh, the editor-in-chief of the most prestigious ethnobiological journal in the world. And honestly, we receive a lot of papers all over the world, but very few of these papers have an innovative approach. So the problem is not in the West. The problem is everywhere. The West has huge responsibilities for having colonized other culture and for still continuing to do so. But uh, uh, it's also the responsibilities of smart people all over the world to, to come up and to invent something new in terms of approach and to bring to the attentions of the scientific society. So we need uh, um, to work together more. And this is uh, a, a crucial point. We need uh, to, uh, to build an inclusive science and uh, a science which uh, look, look forward to the, the future and not the past. <laughs> I yeah, so agree. We, I yeah. don't think we can resolve uh, this, this discussion no. uh, in this manner, but I didn't refer to India and China as big or small. Of course, we respect cultures all over the world. I only refer to them in the sense that there is a science there, an indigenous science there, which is as deep and well constructed, but with a completely different way of looking. Its epistemology is different. It completely way of looking at nature and interpreting nature, but very well constructed. In many other cultures, there will be experiences and practices derived from human senses and the human mind 
but may not have just like i mean european science is certainly a great uh, uh, an in depth way but a particular way it's a molecular way it's an atomic way of looking at the world there are many other ways of looking at the world well constructed just like you have the construction in science those are the kinds of constructions that you can see in india and china but i am not therefore saying that you know the knowledge expressions or the cultural expressions of other they are extremely important you know because they are uh, so I, I i i leave it at that important in ethnobotany because we want to make space <laughs> to minorities you know not to not to reproduce uh, the west in other forms and the mystics of the west so the very start of ethnobotany was in berkeley and was about uh, giving attention to those they have never had a voice so yeah. it's not a matter of indian or italy or albania there are yeah 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 yeah, yeah. We, are not, we, are, we are not really there are people they have never had a voice and they need to um, scientists need to make their voice legitimate let's put in this way so i think we are on the same uh, on the yeah. same line i hope that uh, science will will host more of innovative and inclusive approaches yeah. but uh, it's not easy Thank you, uh, Nishant. Can you take a few questions from the uh, chat box and yes, then sir. close the thing? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, no I can take uh, questions that have been repeated. So, uh, Dr. Andrea, there's a question on how uh, the use. Uh, since you spoke about the use of wild ingredients uh, in the diet, so there's uh, one question from Prakar Rawal: Is if the use of this will have a negative impact on ecosystems like forests? or can the current agricultural landscape be modified into more natural ecosystem to produce these ingredients and parallelly benefit conservation goals at large well these are the two typical uh, false problems we have uh, from uh, the bioscience the wild vegetables most cultures have used in the world are never never rare plants it happens sometimes but this is really very rare we have uh, we have proofs that one of the first plants uh, that got extinct was uh, a sylphion of the ancient greeks It was a ferula species most probably the greeks were so um, so happy to eat it that they were collecting uh, en masse um, on the libyan coast what is nowadays libya so we have also cases of over exploitation but most of the wild vegetables in the world are not rare plants so this is the first point if we want to uh, increase the yield of course agricultural attempts can be made but the problem here is uh, is less and more is less in terms that we need to include these ingredients into small scale economies where farmers can sell also wild plants allowing them to do so it's not always possible if, for example under law um, by law in the west and the second point is that we do not want to uh, transform a supermarket of mcdonald's and shit food into another supermarket of wild foods because the problem is not the ingredient at the end is the logic which is behind we need to provide space for small scale farmers they have connection to their communities we need to build the sustainability that gandhi understood many many decades ago this is what we need to do so we do not need to substitute the shit mcdonalds with the green supermarket this is in my opinion wouldn't change much because uh, it's not a matter of living more because these wild vegetables are very healthy it's a matter of living happier and together and the communities have to have benefits from uh, their activities and their herbs too thank you sir uh, the next question is from diksha verma uh, she is asking how is climate change impacting the use of these wild foods and how do you mitigate this uh, impact well this is exactly what we need to research 
and this is again, I am allergic to this claiming politicians for we are the citizens, you know, we are the citizens. If we have elected idiots, it's our responsibility. So how climate change, I mean, depending, uh, we have two perspectives here. First, we have to convince politicians and stakeholders, institutions to move ahead and do something on climate change instead of blah, 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 or instead of uh, ignoring it, or is instead of even denying it as the American president has done for, for, for some years, the former president, first point. Second point, we need to work as a citizens. We need to stand up and work. That means to understand how local communities already are adapting to climate change. If local communities would wait for politicians, they could die. In most parts of the world, the local communities have already adapted, are adapting every day, every year to climate change with different choices cultivating A instead of B, anticipating the harvest, uh, substituting crops, collecting certain plants from the wild instead of others. We need to research it. And we need to research in order to assist them in this cultural uh, adaptation, which is of course not natural, is produced by humans and produced by the effect of climate change. Uh, thank you, uh, sir. Uh, I'm, I, I believe we have overshot the time, but uh, you, if you have the time, we can uh, take another question if you're fine with it. My pleasure. Uh, so there's a question by Arun Dixit, uh, which you also spoke about in your uh, talk, where you spoke about the transfer of traditional knowledge between communities, how you, in your experience it's horizontal. Now he's asking how documenting traditional knowledge of different plant uses very little work is done on the distribution of this knowledge among the population, especially across gender, age, economic status, occupation types, geographical location of residents, etc. So will such understanding be useful while addressing the issue of transfer of knowledge across generation? How of do you course. see that? We need, yeah. we need these kind of studies in order to answer the question, how can we make the foraging sustainable for the future? If we do not know exactly how this transmission works, how are we going to make this sustainable for the future? That's why it's important that young people, I'm sure there are many years, um, get the enthusiasm to study also the new foraging uh, trends coming up uh, from the social media and trying to see how young people in the world are sensitive to this. This is a unique time in the world. For the first time in the history, the young generations are aware of the horrible consequences of destroying the planet. This is the first time that all young people of the world are aware. It's not only a matter of America. I have contacts in many emerging countries and I know also, I have Indian friends. This sensitivity is everywhere. We need to stand up, make use of this enthusiasm and study how we can build together a more sustainable future. And at the end of the day, it's not just a matter of our planet. We are mid-aged, we have huge responsibilities, but the ones they will pay the responsibility for the irresponsible politics regarding uh, uh, the planet, the destruction of the planet, most of those are young people. Is you guys, you have to stand up and be worried for your future and work then and do research then. Uh, this is a, a very crucial point. You cannot wait for the mid-aged or aged professors to guide these uh, researches, you have to stand up and study and, uh, and trying to understand how to make this sustainable practice into the future. This is uh, our responsibilities, but especially also your responsibility.
Thank you, Dr. Andrea, for that uh, amazing understanding of ethnobotany, food and medicine, and much more. And inspiring, I'm sure a lot of young researchers over here have certainly uh, understood and uh, have been inspired to take this research forward in their own lives. As you said, rightly, is the most important thing is to listen, and not just to listen, but to listen to everyone, uh, respective of their background and communities. Uh, thank you so much, one and all, for uh, joining uh, to this uh, talk. Uh, before going, I just have a small request, if you could just switch on your videos so that we can take a group picture uh, to just have a memory. Yeah, <clears throat> just to add also, uh, Dr. Andrea, we had students from all over the country uh, and professors from different departments, scientists from different departments all over the country. Yes. Just to keep you informed, yeah. We had a good representation from the country. Okay, so I will take the picture at the count of uh, a three. So one, two. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for giving your valuable time, spending our valuable time with us. As I I said this talk will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. Uh, I will be mailing you uh, the link uh, to the talk. Uh, and also, I, I presume that I, you can send me questions uh, that I can send to Dr. Andrea that you could not ask now because of time shortage. We just, uh, like Dr. Andrea said, we don't want to be static. Uh, let's uh, uh, evolve. And thank you so much again for joining. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Andrea. Thank you so much. And... Uh, Yes, Thanks to all of you and stay safe and be strong in this difficult time. We are with you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yes, that's very important. Uh, I wish everyone uh, a good day ahead and also to stay safe. Thank you. As I said, I'll be sending the link of the talk. I'll be mailing it to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.